After the French forces defeated the last Russian resistance near Moscow at the Battle of Borodino, they were now heading unstoppable towards the Russian historical city of Moscow. They would stand there for the rest of the 1812 autumn, but the winter would change the course of this conflict and the dominoes would come crashing in. Napoleon's face. The winter has no mercy. Field Marshal Mikhail Kutuzov's Russian army suffered heavy losses at the Battle of Borodino on September 7, 1812. Before dawn of September 8, Kutuzov ordered a retreat from Borodino eastwards to preserve the army. They camped outside Mozhaisk. Russian sources suggest Kutuzov wrote a number of orders and letters to Fyodor Rostovin about saving the city or the army. On 11 September, Napoleon wrote Marshal Victor to hurry to Moscow, worried about the already enormous losses his massive army had suffered as a result of Barclay and Kutuzov's attrition warfare. On September 12, 1812, the main forces of Kutuzov departed from the village now Golitsino and camp near Odintseva, 20 kilometers to the west. They were followed by Mordia and Jocha Murat's vanguard. On 12 September, Bonaparte, who suffered from a cold and lost his voice, slept in the main manor house of Bolshai Vyazayami on the same sofa in the library that Kutuzov had just the night before. On 13 September, Napoleon left the manor house and headed east. Napoleon and Poniatowski also camped near Odintseva and invited Murat for dinner. In the afternoon, Russian army commanders met at the village of Fili near Moscow. After a long discussion, Kutuzov followed the advice of Karl Tol to retreat to the south, leading to the Battle of Maloyaroslavets. General Mikhail Milorodovich, commander of the Russian rearguard, was concerned by the disposition of the army. It was stretched across Moscow, burdened with a large number of wounded and numerous convoys. Milorodovich sent Captain Fyodor Akinfev of the Hussar Regiment's lifeguards to start peace negotiations with Murat, commander of the French vanguard. Akinfev would deliver a note signed by Colonel Paisy Kaiserov, the duty general of the general staff of the Russian army, stating the wounded left in Moscow are entrusted to the humanity of the French troops, and a verbal message from Milorodovich saying, if the French want to occupy Moscow as a whole, they must, without advancing strongly, let us calmly leave it with artillery and a convoy. Otherwise, General Milorodovich will fight to the last man before Moscow and in Moscow and instead of Moscow will leave the ruins. Akinfev was also to delay by staying in the French camp for as long as possible. On the morning of 14 September, Akinfev and a trumpeter from Milorodovic's convoy arrived at the French line just as the French were resuming their attack with cavalry. They were received by Colonel Clement Louis Ellen de Villeneuve of the 1st Horse Jager Regiment, who sent Akinfev to General Horace Franois Bastien Sebastiani, commander of the two cavalry corps. Sebastiani's offer to deliver the note was refused. Akinfev said that he was ordered to personally deliver the note and a verbal message to Murat. The Russian delegation was sent to Murat. Initially, Murat rejected a compromise. To the note, he replied that it was in vain to entrust the sick and wounded to the generosity of the French troops. The French and captive enemies no longer see enemies. Furthermore, Murat said that only Napoleon could stop the offensive. However, Murat quickly changed his mind and recalled the delegation saying that he was willing to accept Milorodovic's terms to save Moscow by advancing as quietly as the Russians on the condition that the French were allowed to take the city on the same day. Murat also asked Akinfev, a native of Moscow, to persuade the city's residents to remain calm to avoid reprisals. Before leaving, Kutuzov had Rostov and destroy most of Moscow's supplies as part of a scorched earth strategy. This was a different action from the famous burning of Moscow, which would later destroy the city. The Grander Army began entering Moscow on the afternoon of 14 September, a Monday, on the heels of retreating Russian army. Cavalry from the French vanguard encountered Cossacks. From the Russian rearguard, there was no fighting and there were displays of mutual respect. At 14 o'clock, Napoleon arrived at Poklonaya Gora, three miles from the limits of 1812 Moscow. Accompanying him was the French vanguard, arrayed in battle formation by Murat's orders. Napoleon waited for half an hour. When there was no Russian response, he ordered a cannon fire to signal the advance on the city. The French advanced swiftly. Infantry and artillery began entering Moscow. French troops divided before the Dorogomilovsky gate to enter the city through other gates. 
Napoleon stopped at the city walls, the Kayama Kolishki rampart, about 15 minutes away from the Dorogomilovsky gate to wait for a delegation from Moscow. Ten minutes later, a young man told the French that the city had been abandoned by the Russian army and population. The news was met by bewilderment and then despondency and grief. It was not until an hour later that Napoleon resumed his procession into the city, followed by the 1st French cavalry into Moscow. He passed the Dorogomilovsky Yamskaya Sloboda and stopped on the banks of the Moscow River. The vanguard crossed the river, infantry and artillery used the bridge, while cavalry fought it. On the opposite bank, the army broke up into small guard detachments along the river bank and streets. Napoleon continued on with his large retinue. He was preceded by two squadrons of horse guards at a distance of a hundred fathoms, and his uniform was austere compared to those around him. The streets were deserted. On Arbat Street, Napoleon saw only a pharmacist and his family attending to a wounded French general at a stand. At the Borovitsky Gate of the Kremlin, Napoleon said of the walls with a sneer, what a scary wall. According to contemporary accounts, Napoleon ordered food to be delivered to the Kremlin by Russians regardless of gender, age, or infirmity instead of by horse. This was in response to the indifference that the Russians had treated his arrival. According to historian Alexander Martin, Muscovites generally left the city rather than accept the occupation, so that most of the city was empty when the French arrived, and even more Muscovites would leave while the French remained there. Anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 remained in the city. In addition to them, around 10,000 to 15,000 wounded and sick Russian soldiers also remained. For comparison, the city was calculated to host more than 270,000 inhabitants. A police survey from the beginning of 1812 found 270,180 for residents. The frequency of looting by the French army and the local population increased as the occupation continued. Initially, looting was driven by wealth, but later it was for food. Civilians were killed by troops. Attempts by French commanders to maintain discipline failed. As such, many French soldiers took part in these war crimes, even those of the elite Imperial Guard joining their comrades in looting and attacking civilians. The locals, sometimes called the French pagans or besermans, which depicted the French as godless as the desecration of local churches was systematically done by the French army to fill Napoleon's war chest. Arson occurred around the city when the French entered on 14 September. The French believed that Count Fyodor Rostovan, the Moscow governor, ordered the fires, and this is the most widely accepted theory. Furthermore, Rostovan also had all the firefighting equipment removed or disabled. Strong winds, starting on the night of 15-16 September and persisting for more than a day, fanned the flames across the city. A French military court shot up to 400 citizens on suspicion of arson. The fire worsened Napoleon's mood, though he was deeply impressed and disturbed by the Russian scorched earth policies and expressed shock and fear at them. One eyewitness recalled that the emperor said the following about the fire, What a terrible sight! And they did this themselves! So many palaces! What an incredible solution! What kind of people? These are Scythians! Eventually, the intensity of the fire forced Napoleon to escape the Kremlin and relocate to the Petrovsky Palace early in the morning of 16 September, as the fur surrounded him and his entourage. Count Esker described this incident as follows. We were surrounded by a sea of flame. It threatened all the gates leading from the Kremlin. The first attempts to get out of it were unsuccessful. Finally, an exit to the Moscow River was found under the mountain. Napoleon came out through him from the Kremlin with his retinue and the old guard. Coming closer to the fire, we did not dare to enter these waves of the Sea of Fire. Those who managed to get to know the city a little did not recognize the streets disappearing in smoke and ruins. However, it was necessary to decide on something, because with every moment the fire intensified more and more around us. A strong heat burned our eyes, but we could not close them and had to stare forward. The suffocating air, the hot ashes, and the flame of the spiral escaping from everywhere, our breath, short, dry, constrained and suppressed by smoke. We burned our hands, trying to protect our face from the terrible heat, and cast off the sparks that showered and burned the dress. 
Napoleon returned to the Kremlin on 18 September, where he announced his intention to remain in Moscow for the winter. He believed the city still offered better facilities and provisions. He ordered defensive preparations, including the fortification of the Kremlin and the monastery surrounding the city and reconnaissance beyond the city. Napoleon continued to address the empire's state affairs while in Moscow. A municipal governing body, the Moscow Municipality, was created and met at the House of Chancellor Nikolai Rumiantsev on Marisaka 17. Julong, a merchant, was selected to lead the body. He was instructed by Quartermaster Lesseps to choose Philistines and merchants to help him. The 25 members of the municipality searched for food near the city, helped the poor, and saved burning churches. The members were not punished for collaboration after the occupation because they had been conscripted. The French created a municipal police force on 12 October. Napoleon toured the city and nearby monasteries in near daily sojourns. He allowed General Tudelman, the head of the Moscow Orphanage, to write to patron Empress Maria about the conditions of the pupils. He also asked Tudelman to communicate his desire for peace to Emperor Alexander I. Tudelman's messenger to St. Petersburg was allowed through French lines on 18 September. Napoleon sent two other peace proposals. Ivan Yakovlev was a wealthy landowner who remained to care for his young son Alexander Herzen and the mother. He was permitted to leave for St. Petersburg with a letter from the French to Alexander I. The last attempt was on 4 October, when General Jacques Lauriston, the PA war ambassador to Russia, was sent to speak with Kutuzov at Tarutino. Kutuzov refused to negotiate, but promised to relay proposals from Alexander I. Napoleon received no replies to any of the proposals. Churches were not afforded special protections. Some house stables, wood components were used as fuel, and others had their gold and silver items melted down. After the occupation, the Assumption Cathedral of the Moscow Kremlin was closed to the public to hide the damage. I was overwhelmed with horror, finding this revered temple, which spared even the flame, now put upside down the godlessness of the unbridled soldier, and made sure that the state in which it was needed to be hidden from the eyes of the people. The relics of the saints were disfigured, their tombs filled with sewage. Decorations from tombs are torn off. The images adorning the church were stained and split. It was impossible to adequately provision the grander army in a burnt city, with guerrilla warfare by the Cossacks against French supplies and a total war by the peasants against foraging. This warfare weakened the French army at its most vulnerable point, logistics, as it had overstretched its supply. An army marches on its stomach, says Rian. The campaigning to St. Petersburg, Russia's official capital, was out of the question as winter was closing in. The main French army's combat effectiveness had been further reduced by indiscipline and idleness. On 18 October, General Bennigsen's Russian force defeated Murat's French force at the Chernishna River in the Battle of Tarutino. On 18 October, the Second Battle of Polotsk saw another French defeat. Napoleon finally recognized that there would be no peace agreement. On 19 October, the main French army began moving along the old Kaluga Road. Only Marshal Edouard Mortier's cause remained in Moscow. Mortier was the city's governor general. Napoleon intended to attack and defeat the Russian army, and then break out into unforaged country for provisions. However, short on supplies and seeing the fall of the first snows on Moscow, the French abandoned the city voluntarily that same night. Also that night, he made camp in the village of Troitsky on the Dena River and ordered Mortier to destroy Moscow and then rejoin the main army. Mordia was to set fire to wine shops, barracks, and public buildings, followed by the city in general, and then the Kremlin. Gunpowder was to be placed under the Kremlin walls, which would explode after the French left the city. There was only time to partially destroy the Kremlin. The Vodovodvina tower was completely destroyed, while the Nikolskaya, First Bezimunaya, and Petroskaya towers, the Kremlin wall, and part of the arsenal were badly damaged. The explosion set the Palace of Facets on fire. The Ivan the Great Bell Tower, the city's tallest structure, survived demolition nearly unharmed, although the nearby Church of the Resurrection was destroyed. The Russian Army's cavalry vanguard, commanded by General Ferdinand von Winsingrod, was the first to re-enter the city. Winsingrod was captured by Mortier's troops, and command fell to General Alexander von Benkendorf. On 26 October, Benkendorf wrote to General Mikhail Vorontsev. We entered Moscow on the evening of the 11th September. The city was given for plunder to peasants, who flocked a great many and all drunk. 
Carsax and their foreman completed the route, entering the city with hussars and life Carsax. I considered it a duty to immediately take command over the police units of the unfortunate capital. People killed each other on the streets, set fire to houses. Finally, everything calmed down and the fire was extinguished. I had to endure several real battles, 